not been officially informed of these installations uh, by uh, uh, by the Office of Technology and Innovation, and uh, we have since uh, reached out to them, and we will be arranging a presentation in uh, February. Uh, we have uh, gotten them to agree that we can uh, send in our comments subsequent to that presentation, that there is no uh, deadline, as, as may have uh, been stated in that patch article uh, that applies to us in this case. If people want to submit comments, uh, we will uh, uh, gladly uh, forward them on to uh, the Office of Technology Inno Innovation. If people want to submit comments to us, they can send them to uh, our district manager at uh, ebsmith at cb.nyc.gov. Uh, I'm expecting that uh, we will have that. I don't know that the presentation will be at Mike at, at this committee. It may, in fact, be at a different uh, community board committee, uh, but we would certainly make an announcement and let people know. Um, uh, but uh, we, we are definitely going to arrange something so that people can have their uh, questions answered and so that we can get more information about these uh, cell towers and uh, maybe the number of cell towers that are being installed in the community. I don't, I don't know that three is the uh, total number to be anticipated. And uh, I don't know, I, I would be surprised if that's the case. Uh, it seems a little strange that uh, two of them would go up on Fort Washington Avenue. I have some questions myself. So um, uh, if that's the reason why you're attending, uh, I, I would certainly welcome you to uh, come back when uh, the presentation is uh, scheduled in um, in February. Uh, Marissa Beal uh, is raising her hand. Uh, uh, all right, so I'm told that uh, I cannot allow you to talk because you're using an older version of Zoom. Um, choose, uh, oh, hold on one, one moment. Hi. Uh, uh, are you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, no, it's okay. I raised my hand like about 10 minutes ago to say I'm here, but no one could hear me. So um, it's fine. I want to talk about the towers, but I just heard that you're not talking about them. So never mind. All right. I appreciate that. But, uh, uh, but uh, stay tuned uh, so that you can come uh, attend the meeting in February. Uh, hope, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be able to confirm it uh, very soon. We just made the connection with the uh, uh, Office of Technology and Innovation uh, External Affairs person late this afternoon. Great, I will, thank you. All right, very good. Um, all right, hang on a moment here. Uh, all right, so I, okay. Um, all right, the uh, email address again would be, uh, as, as someone has requested, is, uh, I, I guess I could also put it in the uh, Q&A. It's uh, ebsmith at cb.nyc.gov. All right, uh, hopefully people can see that. Um, maybe they can't shoot. Uh, uh, anonymous attendee, did you see it? Uh, okay, somebody else is now typing. All right, very good. Um, all right, so let's uh, uh, let's proceed now with the first presentation. Uh, uh, Tori is uh, Tori Queso is the director of the uh, New York City Carbon Free and Healthy Schools campaign. Uh, she made a presentation before our Youth and Education Committee last month, and apparently it was uh, so impressive uh, that she was recommended to uh, uh, come before our committee as well. Uh, she uh, may be joined, although I don't see him. Uh, uh, Gene Carroll, uh, the, an organizer with the uh, New York City New York City Central Labor Council, is is Gene with us? Gene unfortunately had a conflict pop up at oh. the last minute, so he won't okay. be joining us. So. All right, so uh, uh, so it's all on you. 
It is. It's all on my shoulders. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I, I, I don't really know you, but I, I feel as though I should have confidence that you'll be able to handle this presentation on your own. Uh, I hope so. Let's see. <laughs> Uh, all, right. Give me all right. So let's uh, let, let's hear about the New York City Carbon Free and Healthy Schools campaign. Sure. Let me just um, share my screen real quick. <clears throat> all right. Let's see. Okay. Um, so yes, my name is Troy Queso. I am the uh, campaign director for Carbon Free and Healthy Schools um, in New York City, uh, which is a campaign uh, under Climate Jobs New York. Um, so what Climate Jobs New York is, is it's a coalition of unions here in New York State um, that focus on pro-labor, pro-climate policy, um, pushing an agenda that uh, promotes social, economic, and environmental justice. So I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I can share this um, presentation uh, after the meeting so that you can read word for word everything that it says. Um, but just, just to give you um, a, a general idea of what the Carbon Free and Healthy Schools is calling for in its totality, it would be um, conducting energy efficiency uh, audits, and then also energy efficiency retrofits along with solar installation and battery installation on all um, New York City school pu uh, public school buildings. Um, and as I said, it's a campaign focused on environmental and social justice. Um, and uh, it aims to provide the young people of New York City with opportunities, especially in neighborhoods that have been historically overlooked and under-resourced. Um, using, utilizing the world-class apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs that uh, the, the unions here in New York City have uh, developed. Um, Carbon Free and Healthy Schools has a steering committee. I just want to uh, underscore who is participating in this that is made up of um, the Federation of the UFT, which is the teachers union, uh, CSA, which is the principals and administrators, supervisors of the schools, um, DC 37, who has um, uh, workers in the kitchens and also uh, the school's construction authority has DC 37 employees. Um, 32BJ, which has maintenance workers inside of the schools, and then the New York City Building Trades, as well as the New York City Central Labor Council are all a part of our steering committee. Um, and by investing in schools in this way, uh, the city can create 45,000 good union jobs in New York City communities, make schools healthier and safer for students, teachers, and staff, take on climate change and help the city meet its emissions uh, reductions goals by decreasing carbon emissions by 75 tons, 75,000 tons annually, which is the equivalent of taking 154,000 cars off the road and saving $275 million per year in energy costs, um, which is the sec energy costs are the second highest cost for the Department of Education uh, in the city, which is also a national trend that we see. Um, and what we're specifically calling for uh, in the immediate is uh, the acceleration of solar installation on New York City school buildings to the amount of 150, school, 150 schools per year, as well as con conducting um, the retro energy retrofits uh, with completion of all school buildings by 2030 um, to take advantage of uh, available Inflation Reduction Act funding, as well as conducting all of these retrofits and solar installation work uh, under a project labor agreement, which will ensure um, opportunities for and increasing access to those world-class pre-apprenticeship direct entry programs um, that can provide uh, a lifetime of, of career opportunities for um, folks who go into the, the trades in the unions. <clears throat> um, so I went through most of that. Um, so I just wanted to provide uh, an example of um, sort of the 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 investments that would go into um, schools under under this project. Um, so this is an example of a school in Manhattan, Jacob August Reese, um, and we have a list of the retrofits. So the 
HVAC improvements, roof improvements, LED retrofits, window um, upgrades, and then the solar installation. Um, this particular school has an estimated solar capacity of about 175 kilowatts. Um, and the total estimated cost for that would be 8,593,000. Um, uh, and then you can see that it mostly uses fluorescent lighting, heating controls aren't working, and the roof is leaking and needs to be replaced, which would need to be done before any solar installation occurs. Um, throughout the, so what one step that we have taken in our conversations with the mayor's office um, are the, is that we have uh, recommended an initial list of 100 schools um, throughout the five boroughs. Every single one of these schools resides within an environmental justice area. Um, and the total cost for these schools with the solar installation and the retrofits would be uh, just under $330 million. In Manhattan in particular, um, that list uh, contains 18 schools um, that would have a total estimated cost of just under $82 million. And then in um, the what in within the district of community board 12, uh, that would be five schools. I have the list here Duke Ellington, Ellie Lor Ellen Laurie, um, Professor Juan Bosch, Washington Heights Academy, and B. Fuller Rogers School. No, no, no E, no E at the end of Bosch. Oh, okay. I will, I will fix that. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, could go back to that slide for just a moment. Sure. Um, All right, so this, this is a, a reasonably good coverage from uh, sort of the southern end of our district up to the northern end. Um, uh, I, I like that. Um, and so th these are schools that you have recommended uh, uh, to, uh, to the city DOE. To the, yes, in a conversation with the former, um, uh, first deputy mayor, um, right. she requested, uh, basically the question was, so where do we start? Right. Um, so we came back to her with a list right. of the, uh, hundred schools. These are five right. that we recommended. Um, part of how we constructed that list was, um, DCAS already did, uh, essentially a full audit of all of their school buildings to determine which ones were solar ready. Um, we took it in, in, recent years. Um, so it's a it's a pretty pretty up to date list. We took that list and we narrowed it to the schools that were within environmental justice areas. Um, and as you'll see in the next slide, all five of the schools within um, your community board area uh, are solar ready um, schools and with with the total solar capacity of 86 kilowatts. So theoretically the the roof doesn't need to be fixed. You can go in and you can do that solar installation. Um, and the estimated cost for those five schools would be about $300,000. Um, and then the total estimated cost with the retrofits that we also recommend um, is just under 4 million. Um, with So overall in, in totality throughout all of the schools, um, with the solar installations, we estimate that you could save about 50% of the um, cost of energy, and then the additional 50% would be covered if you did the deep retrofits that we are recommending. Um, so you would be able to, to offset essentially the, the current costs of, of energy from the DOE for the schools. Um, and we have the thing that's really exciting uh, at this point in time is that we have um, this windfall of funding from the federal government, and we're in a very opportune time to take advantage of it. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, with its passage, uh, it in it, it provides um, for a direct payment of income tax credits, which were previously not available to nonprofits and municipalities, but have now been made available to nonprofits and municipalities. Um, so we estimate that the IRA would provide 
1.32 billion in funds to install solar or about 40% of the total 3.3 billion cost for all of the schools um, and also would provide 1.03 billion of the 5.15 billion, which is about 20% of the cost of retrofitting the city's schools. Um, so we have a couple of quick graphics um, over the 30 years with the solar installation and the retrofits. Uh, we estimate that the city would be able to save 8.25 billion. Um, and then quick example, since we're recommending 150 schools for solar installation a year, a uh, quick example of um, how much that would cost, it would be about $44 million, or, or sorry, it would be um, the, the $45 million. And then um, from that, for the IRA tax credits, we would get about $19.2 million. There are a number of other incentives and um, uh, funding sources that could go towards that. Um, but we do estimate that, so the annual loan payments would be just above $2 million and the annual solar revenue would be $2.9 million. Um, so the, the revenue and cost savings would be outpacing the loan payments, um, which means that the payback period would be four years, which is pretty quick for um, uh, you know city projects like this. Um, and then over 30 years, it would be a just over $44 million savings. That's incredible. Um, it's, it's, yes, it's, <laughs> it's a, it's a great opportunity. It's, it's uh, one of those, one of those moments where you need to spend money to make money actually applies um, here. Uh, so I just wanted to touch really quickly on the workforce development side of it, because we do view this as a green jobs initiative, um, first and foremost. Um, the New York City building trades have done a very good job of uh, investing time and resources into creating what they call the Apprenticeship Readiness Collective, which is a collection of uh, four pre-apprenticeship programs that offer direct entry into union apprenticeship programs, one of which is C-Skills, um, which some of their funding does come from the DOE, so they are directly connected into the high schools, um, and it provides the training and direct entry access to high school seniors. Um, new, which is non-traditional employment for women, Helmets to Hard Hats, which is for uh, active duty um, veterans, National Guard and Reservists who are transitioning into careers, and then P2A, Pathways to Apprenticeship, um, which originally started out as uh, um, for mostly justice-involved individuals, and they do still serve that um, constituency as well, um, but it also has expanded um, to provide training and mentorship for uh, people from low-income communities um, as well beyond that. And as I said, those provide direct entry into apprenticeship programs um, within the unions, which provide training and uh, certification and um, career pathways that uh, provide lifelong lasting careers with benefits and retirement and the ability to buy homes and all of these great things. And they aren't just one shot jobs um, for, you know, a solar installation project um, that leaves you high and dry. There are, you know, folks who can start out on a project like, like this, uh, where they're, you know, working on retrofits for schools uh, one year. And then in a couple of years, they're working on, you know, high rise buildings or they're working on, um, you know, a Penn Station project or some, something big like that. So they, they, it, it, it certainly does lead to um, a pathway that, that uh, can provide uh, lifelong careers. And that is the end of my presentation. Any questions I can gladly answer. Yeah, well, let, let me begin. And then we do have a number of questions in the Q&A, uh, which we'll get to uh, after, after I, uh, we run through the committee. Um, sure. it, it, are, are, you, are you saying here that the, uh, that the federal funding that might be available through the Inflation Reduction Act would, uh, would cover the initial outlay by the city? 
that uh, is so no so it would be sort of opposite the city would need to authorize a uh, bridge loan essentially um and then would go to the ir the irs and uh um apply for this this direct um payment uh but um essentially there has been i think there is a maximum but it's like billions upon billions of dollars <laughs> at this point so um, it is a, a prime opportunity for us to um, take advantage of it uh, as, as you know, the, there's no guarantee that in the future we will have such a amenable um, administration. Um, and uh, but yeah, so they would have to provide the bridge loan financing, um, but pretty immediately after you do the solar installation, certainly um, you start uh outpacing the cost savings um versus the loan payments and, and is it is it your um um is it your understanding that uh, virtually every school building uh, could eventually take advantage of this program and uh and, and be considered solar ready yes um we the the whole purpose of it is that by 2030 every single school building um has had the audit they've had a uh, um energy efficiency retrofits that are recommended from the audit and then if they are able to they have um and have the capacity to do so they've installed solar um it also you know these audits would be all encompassing of if geothermal is an option um and and other renewable uh energy options as well all right so let me ask uh, my committee members uh whether they have any questions. Um, okay, uh, uh, we'll open it up to the public. Um, so, um, all right, well, I think the first question I see here is from uh, Allegra Legrand, and uh, uh, she's asking, um, uh, she's saying the Washington Heights Academy, uh, which I believe is the school on uh, uh, Sherman, um, yeah, up and inward is uh, scarcely a decade old. Why is it at the top of the list? And and then she uh, adds that uh, PS five is uh, is pretty young too. Uh, PS five, I believe, might have been, might have been built in the eighties. So at this point, uh, let's say it's forty years old, which is still uh, younger than some of our other buildings, I guess. So and and uh, to, and her, certainly yes, uh, yeah. But, the, I mean, uh, hold off, Tori. Uh, she's continuing here and says, I would have guessed that IS-52, which is uh, Broadway and Academy Street, uh, would have a much uh, lower efficiency uh, than either uh, a PS-366, which I believe is the Washington Heights Academy, or a PS-5. So that, uh, that's the uh, thrust of her question. Yes. Yeah, so um, to answer that, uh, like I said earlier, um, the bulk of the list uh, of the hundred that we have recommended um came from the decas audit uh to determine um solar readiness so a newer building in an environmental justice area is going to have a newer roof and which is going to make it uh more viable for being solar ready um it and we didn't necessarily go off of energy efficiency for the specific building what we did was we kind of overlaid um the the solar readiness but also um things like asthma um hospitalizations um for children and and some some other factors um such as that so interestingly um building age doesn't necessarily have uh such a direct correlation to energy efficiency that you would think it would um overall like there are some buildings uh like in manhattan that were built in the 1800s that are um have equal efficiency to to newer relatively newer buildings um, but we did it in more of a kind of a environmental justice um overlaid with uh childhood asthma rates 
um, and a couple of other factors, uh, combining it with the DCAS Solar Ready um, uh, list, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't recommend, you know, the the um, the school that um, she mentioned. Um, it just means that in order to get started quickly, um, this is uh, what we thought would be uh, the a, a good a good starting point. Okay, but as I asked you earlier, I, I, the objective is to uh, uh, presumably reach uh, virtually every single school. Do building. everything. Yes. Yep. We oh. we are. It, it, yes, every every single building um, is the goal by 2030 um, as the initial step, like in the next year, and actually getting things done. This list of 100 is what we recommended. Um, it is certainly not, you know, if if we go in and and speak to members of the administration they're like well we think this building we think that building if if they want to <laughs> add buildings to the list we're, we are more well, yeah. than happy happy to do so you we would love to see every single one done you wouldn't give them an argument but maybe no exactly <laughs> but uh but uh, uh but maybe we could work with you and get some more information about the uh, current condition of these buildings and uh and uh in our regular advocacy for a community uh um, of projects, we can argue that uh, uh, our schools should be uh, should get these energy efficiency improvements uh, sooner rather than later. Sure. Um, absolutely. All right. So uh, our anonymous attendee asks, uh, what is the timeline for the DOE schools that are not solar ready, essentially the older school buildings? Is there a cost analysis for the older schools? So we have... Um, kind of an overall cost estimate um, for everything soup to nuts, um, not including battery installation. It's at about ten billion dollars, um, but down to the level of each individual school beyond the schools that we've analyzed in this list of a hundred so far, um, we don't have like that that specific detailed HVAC cost. Um, solar installation costs, but that is certainly something that like, if, if we are adding schools to the list that we can do, it's just not something that our policy researchers have done quite yet. All right, well, his, I, you can always count on Allegra to bring up an interesting point. So uh, uh, he, I, uh, so uh, Allegra is back with, a, with, a, um, with, with another a bit of insight. Uh, the older schools are a bigger target for improving energy efficiency. Uh, yes, I think we will agree. However, sealing these schools up to not leak energy deep retrofit also seals up recycled air because most of these schools also use window units and radiators without modern HVACs. That change has other public health implications, uh, COVID, and is a trickier problem that deserves front loading, uh, not waiting until the end. So. Uh, so, you know, I think that we would have to agree with them. Yes, and, and upgrading um, the HVAC systems is one of the top uh, recommendations in the um, initiative. Um, and it is, it okay. is yep, some, something we have uh, highlighted in all of our conversations. All right, very good. Okay, and anonymous attendee has another question. Uh, was the board in, involved in choosing the schools besides... Um, meeting the standards uh, by, by the board, if you're referring to the community board, um, no, this is our first uh, um, presentation and learning about this campaign, uh, which uh, uh, so, uh, and the, the campaign apparently, according to Tori, uh, came up with these recommendations on its own uh, based on the uh, uh, schools that had undergone the, the audits. Um, uh, Allegra, geothermal is, 100% hard in New York City because shallow water is brackish. And uh, anonymous attendee, PS128, PS115, PS173, all, all, all older schools. Uh, yeah, I think especially 115 uh, might in fact be the oldest one. Um, uh, and uh, the participatory budget should be in on this since they are proposing plans to renew electricity in some schools in the district. That's a good idea. Uh, that's one, maybe one way to help uh, get some of that funded. Um, and uh, can an older school petition to get on the list higher if it has HVAC? Um, I don't know, Tori, uh, 
if it has HVAC systems in operation, for example. Uh, Tori, would you have any idea about that? Um, sure. I mean, uh, we are totally open to analyzing um, any recommendations that you have. That's part of the reason why we're coming to you, because we know that you are much more uh, deeper involved in the uh, ongoings of the community and the schools and 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 you have a uh, much more thorough knowledge of like the day-to-day -day, um, issues uh in in those schools um so that's that's part of why we're coming to you because we you know acknowledge that you were a great resource um and also uh very vocal um it, when you know advocates for for the community um so if there are schools that you think uh we should be taking a look at because um you know we we haven't visited all 1200 physical school buildings um we our policy researchers mostly take in um you know information that is uh um uh, information and data that comes from the city. Um, so a lot of it is recycling city data. So, you know, the, the anecdotal um, information we certainly find very valuable. So if there is any anecdotal information that you think would rise to the level of recommending um, a certain school, um, we will absolutely take it under consideration. Um, in terms of the geothermal, I'm not a geothermal expert, um, but I do know that one of the climate jobs affiliates, um, the uh, UA, which uh, is like plumbers and pipe fitters and seam fitters, um, have been very involved in um, advocating for geothermal uh, legislation um, and uh, are involved in advocating for the funding of um, uh, like geothermal networks uh, within New York City as well as uh, throughout the state. Um, so they 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 seem to think that it is very viable. I'm sorry, let me hold things up for just a moment. Uh, Paola, I got a call from Jay Mazer, who says that uh, he wasn't able to, uh, uh, to connect uh, using either the panelist link or the, uh, the regular uh, link for the meeting. Have you got okay. something else? And is he going to call in? He has called in previously on his phone. Like I told you, he has issues that I right. can't troubleshoot because I'm not on his side. Right. All right. Well, he, um, uh, shoot. Uh, he knows how to call in. He's called in then to other meetings. Yeah. All right. Can, can you reach out to him? Sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right, Tanya, you have a question? Yeah, sorry about that. I had to unmute. Um, yeah, I, I um, you know, thank you. I want to thank our community for um, their wonderful questions. Um, that's what we're here for. Uh, and so to hear from them, and I think those questions were, were great. And uh, uh, I, I just want to echo, you know, support for those uh, questions. Um, and uh, particularly, um, uh, one that makes sure that community boards, uh, that our board is on the front end, you know, of, of the process. Because um, as it stands, you know, uh, things have already sort of started and then we're sort of behind that. So it just would have been great, you know, and just in terms of just making sure that our community has input from the outset, right? Um, and, and that, if there is a possibility to, you know, to kind of analyze about how do we make sure that the board is, is like in that first stage of, of outreach, you know? Because um, uh, by extension, you know, we represent the community and, and the desires of the community and perhaps we could have done something to, you know, to spread word and make your, you know, outreach a lot easier. Uh, and more expansive, you know, because um, I think this, this is wonderful that that's being done. Uh, but yeah, I just want to make sure that that's, you know, emphasize that it's very important that we um, know about these things because, you know, it could, you know, um, at, at, the, at the front end instead of the back end, um, it's very important. Um, and, and then the other uh, question I have, and I, and I know that it's not necessarily just pertaining to, to this particular uh, com committee, 
But in terms of when these when this is happening, this work, what is going to be the uh, plan for? Um, and, and I hope if I if you've already answered this, I apologize. But what's going to be the plan for creating for making sure that uh, people in the community uh, are able to uh, get jobs related to this particular work? Um, you know, because yes, we are a health and environment, but uh, the environmental uh, uh, strides that are being made, we want to make sure that our community is being is included in that and able to participate. Right. You know, in that innovation. No, that's a it's a very good question, and uh, and I would hope that at a, at a minimum, people in our community could uh, take advantage of the apprenticeship programs and uh, then become um, members of unions. So this this could be a very good way to. Uh, a, a job entry program and uh, get, getting people uh, so, uh, not not just immediate work in these particular schools, but uh, but actual careers. So um, uh, I, I I I think the, I, I look upon this as really uh, being a, a very important opportunity, and uh, I'm I'm glad you raised that question. Yeah, just one uh, one more thing. I'm sorry, Stephen. And I'll, um, yeah, and so yes, with that. Uh, making sure that we are informed so we can get the word out to the community, like making sure we're on the front line of that uh, so that people know and we can you know, work with you in partnership to get that word out. But also recognize that some people in our community already have background and skills and um, may not necessarily be ready to participate immediately without any type of you know, uh, apprenticeship or anything like that. So looking, you know, considering the skills that were already here in the, in the community, you know, it, it, to draw them in as well. Thank you, Steve, sorry. All right, very good. Well, uh, well, that's, uh, I'm, I mean, you know, I, I wanna commend uh, Tori for, uh, uh, and uh, the campaign for taking on this initiative and uh, raising these issues and opening up these opportunities and, uh, and for uh, bringing us into the fold and, uh, and giving us this uh, presentation. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be the beginning of a, a beautiful relationship, as uh, as I think uh, Humphrey Bogart might have once said in some uh, old movie. Um, uh, are there any other? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I I can just uh, unless there's any other questions, I can just no, close, okay. close close yeah. out. Yeah, you want to give us a sum of. Uh, summary. Sure. sure. Yeah, I was just, just going to um, sort of briefly uh, respond to Tanya. Um, you know, one of the major reasons why we are coming to you is because, um, yes, this campaign launched in, I think, April of 2020. Um, but um, the the initiative itself has not been operationalized. And so we are still in, you know, we have been talking to the city council, we have been talking to the mayor and um, members of his administration. Administration. Um, we've met with the school's chancellor and the DOE and the SCA. So, you know, we're, we're having those conversations, but there is, it's not, you know, signed, right? Like it's not done yet. So we are going to need a lot of advocacy. Um, and in particular, in the beginning years, when we're advocating for specific schools or specific areas, um, we're going to need partners on the ground um, to also, you know, to back up the the, the advocacy for those um, specific schools so that it's not all going towards, you know, um, uh, 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 certain areas or certain schools or certain districts. Um, and in terms of the uh, um, recruitment for pre-apprenticeships and apprenticeships, um, we would also, we are uh, uh, part of making this connection is that once once we are a go in that, um, you know, we would want the, the purpose is for the lasting economic benefits to uh, go to the same areas where those environmental benefits and the inf infrastructure benefits um, are, are uh, being made as well. So we want those jobs to go to folks in the communities who are in the areas where the schools um, getting retrofitted um, and, and receiving solar installations um, are going to. Um, so we would work with you to to spread the word, to do advertisements, um, recruitment, and everything like that. Um, so we would we would want uh, you know want to work with you um, on the ground in in terms of that as well. Um, so right, well, I, yeah, I just I, wanted to say thank you to everybody. 
Well, I want to say thank you to you, and I want to make it clear that uh, uh, that our committee would uh, would be working uh, hand in hand in hand with uh, the Youth and Education Committee. Uh, as much as I might want to uh, steal this from them, uh, we certainly would want to work closely with them. This is a uh, a good uh, opportunity for uh, uh, you know cooperation between our two committees. We both have uh, uh, reasons to be uh, uh, um, excited about this prospect. So uh, uh, we, we certainly look forward to working with you. Uh, we hope you uh, you will uh, come back to us, you know, maybe every now and then, uh, uh, give us updates and uh, uh, give us guidance on what we can do to help you and and move this thing along. Certainly, I think in the very short term, I think we have um, you know a letter of support that uh, we can send um, that if you and the Youth and Education Committee are willing to sign on to, um, that would be very helpful. Um, and then in the long term, we will certainly keep you in the loop and come back and give you updates as as progress is being made. Yeah, but uh, send that on to us. And uh, uh, the, the way it uh, the way we work uh, on the board is that. Uh, our committees would make a recommendation to the full board uh, to endorse the uh, campaign. Uh, we would uh, uh, jointly uh, sponsor a resolution, would go before the full board, and the full board would uh, then uh, vote on it. Uh, but before you leave, uh, uh, we either have a question or a comment uh, from uh, someone who is pretending to be Julio Batista, but clearly is not. Uh, and, and, and I recognize her as being Sandra Harris. I use this link. <laughs> Hi, I just have um, one question and I, I really appreciate this and I'm so glad um, that Steve mentioned the education committee. Um, I was wondering if you can share some of the work that you, um, the outreach to parent coordinators in different schools that are being targeted or has there been any outreach to that community? To parent coordinators in specific, um, there hasn't been much done. Um, most of our like internal school outreach, um, we rely on uh, the UFT as our affiliate to sort of um, guide us in in that in that respect. However, if you have recommendations of who we should be reaching out to, um, we will gladly take them on and and reach out to them because we want to make sure that um, you know yeah, this, this. I, I think th parents will be your your biggest advocate in terms of some of those schools that could really use the services. As as it was noted, it seems that the younger or um, most recent schools have been targeted when, in fact, we do have numerous schools that would de definitely benefit um, from the program. And I'm sure the parents would want to um, advocate on, on, on those schools' behalf. Yep, absolutely. Well, I think every every, every school would benefit. And what I, um, you know, I, I believe all five of the schools that have been uh, targeted right. mm -hmm. uh, are, uh, are in, uh, you know, Eastern Broadway. They're all in areas where uh, uh, mm -hmm. where certainly we we, uh, we would want to see uh, uh, this program uh, uh, utilized. So um, I, I I don't I don't I wouldn't be uh, I don't criticize the selection of these schools at the least in the least. But I uh, especially they're, uh, they're all deserving. We need them in all the schools. That, that's yeah. That, yeah. You stole, that's that's, you stole that's the what we want you to keep my, saying. <laughs> Sandra, you yeah. stole the words out of my mouth. Okay. Um, Got it. <laughs> all right. So uh, 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 Tori, uh, we're gonna we're stay in touch. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, very good. And uh, uh, you can tell Gene that you didn't really need him tonight. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. All right, very good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, a second on the agenda is, uh, and I'm I'm probably going to uh, screw up the doctor's name. Is um, and uh, I've even lost his name. Is yeah, uh, Dr. Nasir Nakvi? That's right. Uh, yes. Uh, excuse me. Yes, that's fine. Yes, it's Nasser. Okay, that is fine. Hello. Okay, good. And uh, he's the director of the uh, Gambling Disorder Clinic, uh, uh, which is uh, sponsored within the uh, Columbia University Irving Medical Center and is uh, actually housed, I believe, at the uh, New York State Psych Psych Psychiatric Institute uh, on Riverside Drive. Uh, is any of that correct? Yes. Uh, well, there's some some minor qualifications that I will make as part of the talk. It's, okay, it's, no, well, yeah, uh, I assume it's, you're qualified to make the qualifications. Okay. I, 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 I believe so. Let's see. <laughs> but okay. anyway, yep. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Rudd, uh, take it away. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to speak to the community board. This is actually the first time I've ever spoken to the community board, and so it's really a pleasure. And I was, it was actually enjoyed 
watching the last speaker and sort of understanding a little bit about this this kind of process and it seems like it's a really valuable thing that you all are doing kind of you know um acting as a sounding board for important decisions in the community yeah, so, it's, it's really it's really not a gamble to come to the community board right it, 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 <laughs> that's it, a good it, one <laughs> it, it, it's mostly a sure bet that that uh, that, that it could only be beneficial okay that that was that was a good one. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm sure you were waiting for for the opportunity to use that one. That was really no, good. no. I just came up with that. You just okay. came up with it. Okay, even yeah, better. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm uh, I'm not going to cut know. you off again. Just go ahead. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, so a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have some some slides that I can share. Uh, let me just uh, get that up. I think that's um, yeah. Here we go. Uh, so let me just put this up and let's get up to the top and then let's put that on the full screen. Can everybody see my screen yes. here? Yeah, very okay. Good. All right. So uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here to present to the uh, community board uh, 12. And um, so uh, I am uh, Nasser Nakhvi. I'm uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University. Relevant to our discussion today, I'm the director of the Gambling Disorders Clinic which is, you know, technically this is actually a clinic that is that is run by the New York State Psychiatric Institute. And actually I might give a little brief primer on the relationship between the New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia University for those of you who, who may be curious about it. Um, the, uh, and, I, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so, so the, um, and, and just to kind of give you a little bit of background on why I'm actually talking to you all. First of all, you know, it's great to, to talk to the community board, but you know, we have a specific kind of requirement that's actually part of our certification process, which we're currently undergoing. Um, and, and so the, the certification is through uh, the, the uh, OASAS, which is the Off Office of Addiction Supports. And uh, the certification uh, essentially requires acknowledgement by the local community board, right? So, so I'm presenting to you guys, giving you a little description uh, for the purposes of this, of this certification. Um, so our our clinic uh, is a is a treatment clinic that is located in the New York State Psychiatric Institute, which is uh, located in the 1051 Riverside Drive. I'm sure many of you have actually walked by it, driven by it. It's that kind of uh, modern green building right off the West Side Highway. Uh, what we do is we provide uh, treatment of gambling disorder, and I'll talk a bit about gambling disorder a bit later in the talk. Uh, and our, our treatments are free treatments provided to New York State residents, uh, and our, our treatments are funded by OASAS. Um, and so uh, just a little bit about the structure of the New York State Psychiatric Institute and how we fit within it. So the New York State Psychiatric Institute is a, uh, is a state facility. It's the Office of Mental Health of New York State. And so the Office of Mental Health and OASAS are actually two separate state agencies, the Office of Mental Health is a state agency that is primarily tasked with uh, treatments of mental, mental illnesses, things like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, stuff like that. And OASAS is the state agency that is tasked with uh, the, the treatment of addictions. And many of you may be asking, uh, well, why are there two separate state agencies for these things that are highly interrelated uh, and, you know, many people have both problems. And indeed, as a psychiatrist myself, we understand uh, addictions as psychiatric disorders. So there's a whole history behind why there are two state agencies. And in fact, this is actually related to some of the complexities of our structure. So even though we are housed within the New York State Psychiatric Institute that is essentially owned and operated by OMH, we, we are funded by OASAS. And that leads to some administrative, um, you know, uh, kind of footwork that I have to deal with. Um, but, but basically, the Columbia University Department of Psychiatry is the academic department of Columbia University Medical Center that essentially operates the New York State Psychiatric Institute. So the New York State Psychiatric Institute is, is again, it's a state facility. It's a state-owned facility. Many of us are paid in part by New York State or entirely by New York State. Um, but many of us, in fact, most of us who are who are psychiatrists in this department are also faculty within the Columbia University. So, so the Gambling Disorders Clinic, even though it's affiliated with Columbia University, it's not actually administratively part of Columbia University, where we're part of the New York State Psychiatric Institute. And the Research Foundation for Mental Hygiene, to make it even more complicated, is essentially 
a, a, a kind of a business entity within the New York State Psychiatric Institute, or actually I should say within the Office of Mental Health that allows uh, the Institute to receive grants from the federal government. Because as you probably are aware, you know, states can't really receive like direct funding from the federal government for research. It has to be kind of routed through this, this entity. So we are actually technically funded through the Research Foundation for Mental Hygiene and the money comes initially from OASAS. It's a it's a grant that we get from them that is kind of routed through the research foundation. Um, anyway, that's probably more than you need to know. Yeah, let, let, let's let's uh, uh, let's, let's get into the, let's get into the services actually. Sure, provided sure, by sure. Happy to do that. So, just wanted to give a little bit of background there okay. in case people want to know about. It. Okay, so but that, but the but services that, but now, now we're completely mystified. But, uh, uh, but okay, uh, glad that was my point is to basically. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think you yeah yeah you succeeded. Good. So uh, yeah, it. excellent. All right. So um, so the the gambling disorders clinic at at New York State Psychiatric Institute uh, is tasked with with tr with with essentially treating of gambling disorders, and what that means is essentially screening, assessing, and providing treatment for gambling disorder. Primarily, the type of treatment that we provide is individual treatment with trained psychotherapists, uh, and there's usually you know. Um, weekly sessions that patients have with the therapists, uh, and it's focused on, on gambling disorder. In addition to this individual treatment that is targeted towards patients who are suffering from gambling disorder, we also provide a kind of a family therapy for what we call concerned significant others, people who are often related to the person who has gambling disorder. Uh, and this is geared towards, you know, things like, well, you know, my, my son has a gambling problem, but he has no interest in getting help for his problem. Well, this type of family therapy called community reinforcement and family training is intended for the for the family members who want to help their uh, significant other engage with treatment. You know, often the significant other is is not interested in treatment or they don't think that they have a problem. So it's a way to help essentially get patients into treatment that we ultimately provide. Um, since the COVID uh, pandemic began, we've actually shifted to a primarily a telehealth model where we're providing at this time uh, 100% uh, uh, you know, Zoom-based uh, psychotherapy services, though eventually we will move back to uh, in-person treatments. Um, and another part of our, our role is to provide community outreach and, and education about gambling disorder uh, to various stakeholders. Uh, so um, just a little graphic here to just remind everybody that, that gambling uh, is commonly, you know, it's, it's part of life in, in, in New York State and in the city. There are many ways to gamble. Um, and it's it's an extremely easy and available thing to get into, right? And so, you know, you can gamble online, you can gamble in person, you can gamble at the racetrack, you can gamble on sports, you can gamble in the casino. Um, and there are uh, legal ways to gamble and then there are illicit ways to gamble. And our, our patients really engage in the entire spectrum uh, of gambling problems. Um, and this is also to say that uh, there's been a recent uptick in, in the need uh, for our services, because as you, as many of you may know, uh, online sports betting uh, has has recently been legalized in the state of New York, and now what we are facing uh, in New York City is the potential opening of several casinos within within the city. The closest casino, I think, right now is the the uh, Empire uh, uh, Casino in Yonkers. Um, so you know, we we assume that we're going to have a bit of an uptick in uh, patients who are presenting to us with gambling disorder. So uh, it's important to distinguish between what we would call recreational gambling versus a gambling disorder, right? So, so many of you may occasionally gamble and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and you know, it's a source of recreation, it's a source of pleasure. And so we think of recreational gambling as gambling with, with money that you can afford to lose, right? So it's a kind of like a, you know, a cost of being entertained. And uh, there is a prospect of winning more money, um, but often the, the, the consequences of losing money are not catastrophic. Uh, and it provides a bit of a social connection, uh, some some competitive aspect, and even can be used as a way to to give charity to people as well, depending on where you're gambling. Problematic gambling or gambling disorder is a different thing, right? So that's where the risk and the loss, especially the loss, is really beyond one's means to recover. So most of the patients that we treat have significant debt that they have incurred uh, through gambling, and often those debts are are catastrophic. They they've led to divorce, they've led to foreclosures, they've led to all sorts of problems. Um, 
people who have gambling disorder, at least they perceive they are gambling to solve their money problems. Although as you are, as many of you know, the house always wins and people with gam who gamble to make money, they, they, they never really succeed at that. People with gambling disorder will also use gambling as a way to manage certain negative emotions like anxiety or depression, right? And that's that's different from how people will gamble recreationally or to cope with life stressors or personal loss. And often there are distorted uh, cognitions around gambling that, you know, that I will eventually win, that I will eventually recoup my money, that this is not problematic, that everybody gambles to this extent. These kinds of things are also present in gambling disorder. So gambling disorder is actually a formal diagnosis that currently exists within the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders in the fifth edition. It didn't always exist in that manual, but it is now a formal diagnosis that, that we make with these criteria. Just like any psychiatric disorder, uh, patients have to meet these criteria in order to qualify as having a gambling disorder. And this is part of our assessment is to determine whether patients meet these criteria. Um, and really, you only need to meet one or two criteria uh, or actually, I'm sorry, you have to have at least three criteria to have a mild gambling disorder. And there's a spectrum of severity that is determined by the number of criteria that you meet. And these are the criteria listed here. Uh, right. So th these criteria actually resemble in many ways the criteria for a substance use disorder. And you know, there are obvious differences between gambling disorder and substance use disorders. Uh, primarily, when people are gambling, they're addicted to a behavior right, uh, versus people who are have a substance use disorder like alcohol use disorder, or opioid use disorder, they're, they're addicted to a, to a chemical, right? And, um, and there's interesting science behind this, but, but we, we think that the brain basis of gambling disorder and substance use disorders are, are quite similar. Uh, and this may be because of the particular way in which gambling taps into the dopamine system in the brain and causes changes in learning and all sorts of pathological processes that lead to a loss of control in the face of negative consequences. Um, so in terms of, you know, how widespread this problem is, you know, some, somewhere between sort of three and 4% of the U.S. population would meet criteria for a gambling disorder. 1% of that would meet criteria for a severe gambling disorder. It's, it's also quite prevalent uh, among young people. Um, and when you get into the population of people who have psychiatric disorders like anxiety, depression, uh, or, or who have substance use disorders, the, the, the incidence of gambling disorder increases markedly. So there's a lot of co comorbidity between gambling disorder and other substance use and psychiatric disorders. It's also quite common uh, in active duty military uh, compared to the civil, civilian population. And also older adults are actually uh, particularly vulnerable to gambling disorder. Um, and and it's a, it's a, they're vulnerable to, to, to many issues in general, but, but gambling as well. And certain ethnic groups as well also have particular vulnerabilities to gambling disorder. Um, and again, that's complex and, the, and there are many factors at play there. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, other disorders, so, so as I alluded to, people with gambling disorder, many of them have other substance use disorders, right? So, or other addictive disorders. So up to 75% have an alcohol use disorder, 70% with a tobacco use disorder, nicotine use disorder, personality disorders, depression, anxiety, uh, other substance use disorders, bipolar disorder. These are all highly prevalent among individuals with gambling disorder. Um, and uh, a lot of people with gambling disorder have, you know, both pre-existing and gambling induced financial relationship and employment and legal problems. There's also a very high rate of suicide uh, among individuals uh, with gambling disorder. So one in five individuals with gambling uh, addiction or gambling disorder attempt suicide in their lives. And the other thing is it doesn't just affect the people who are having the gambling disorder. It's also affecting people close to them, people in their families, people who depend on them financially and emotionally. So in terms of the treatments for gambling disorders, the mainstay of treatment, the treatment that has been shown to be most effective uh, for the treatment of this disorder is cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is essentially a type of therapy that involves developing kind of coping skills to manage some of the same things you're trying to manage with, with gambling, right? Um, also figuring out ways to avoid gambling related situations and sort of manage your cravings for gambling and so on using a kind of a skills-based approach, okay? So this is different from like psychoanalysis, for example, where you just talk about, you know, whatever's on your mind or, you know, talk about your mother and things like that. Those, those approaches do not work for gambling disorder. Motivational interviewing is another uh, treatment that's kind of linked to cognitive behavioral therapy. We often use it for patients who are kind of ambivalent about treatment or don't, aren't quite ready to get 
get treatment yet. They're in treatment, but they're ambivalent about whether they want to change. So motivational interviewing is a way to kind of help patients who might have that ambivalence to move towards uh, more interest in change, more interest in reducing their gambling by helping them to kind of grapple with some of the consequences of their behavior in a non-judgmental way. Um, we, at least in our clinic, we, we use these treatments primarily because they have the strongest evidence basis. And also the types of treatments that we use are based on structured, manualized therapies that have been shown to work in multiple settings, right? So this is not just like, you know, we'll just do some informal treatment or you know, get a bunch of people who, who suffered from gambling problems themselves, sit down and tell you what worked for them, right? There are other programs that do it that way. Um, but we are actually working, uh, having licensed therapists with, with master's level and doctoral level uh, therapists who are experts in providing these treatments provide them. Um, other treatments that are helpful for, for uh, gambling disorder include group therapies, group treatments, Gamblers Anonymous. It's kind of like an Alcoholics Anonymous type of treatment. We encourage a lot of patients to attend Gamblers Anonymous, as well as Smart Recovery, which is similar to Gamblers Anonymous, has some in, in, in interesting differences. Another important thing is to evaluate for and, and, and treat co-occurring disorders, like all those things I mentioned before, the depression, anxiety, other substance use disorders. Medications have a limited role in the treatment of gambling disorders. There, there are some patients who respond well to uh, opioid antagonist medications like naltrexone, interestingly, which is used also for alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder, again, speaking to the uh, you know, shared mechanisms of these disorders. Um, antidepressant medications may also have some effect as well. Um, so we provide the full spectrum of the, of the treatments at our gambling disorders clinic. Uh, this is, I alluded to this before, this is community reinforcement and family training. Uh, this is another, I think, a unique type of treatment that, that we provide, has a good, strong evidence basis for gambling disorder. Again, this is really focused on family members of the person who has a gambling disorder. So in this treatment, often it's the just the, the husband or the wife of the person or the parent of the person who has a gambling disorder who's coming to us. And the person with the gambling disorder isn't even in treatment yet, right? And so the goal here is to engage them with treatment using a kind of like a positive reinforcement, non-punitive, non-angry way of dealing with the person and helping sort of nudge them towards uh, an interest in treatment and change. Um, and, and in fact, it has a significant uh, uh, effectiveness for engaging patients, the, the, the person who has a gambling disorder in treatment after one year. And then it also helps the, the concerned significant other to kind of cope with the fact that they have somebody who they love who is, you know, has a gambling problem, because often that has already kind of uh, caused problems within the relationship. So in terms of, you know, how this is addressed in, in the country, I mean, this, this figure is meant to give you an idea. When we look at like substance use disorders, like alcohol use disorder, you know, there's, they're quite prevalent, about 19 million people in the US in the last year have a substance use disorder. And, you know, we spend a quite a bit of money, you know, although not enough, treating gambling, I mean, substance use disorders, right? And if you look here, this red dot, the big red dot is the number of people with gambling disorder. So it's smaller than the number of people with substance use disorder. But look at how much money is invested in the treatment of gambling disorder or research on gambling disorder, right? It's proportionally much, much, much less uh, compared to uh, you know, at least with respect to the number of people who have gambling disorder. The other thing that's also, uh, I think, problematic is that at the federal level, you know, there's the NIH institutes that the divisions that deal with substance use disorders, alcohol use disorder, uh, mental health problems, they each have their own separate kind of um, divisions within NIH, and they fund research on these problems. There is no funding that comes from the federal government on gambling disorder. It's as if the federal government has really very little interest in funding research on this problem. Okay, um, and so that's one of the reasons why we we get funding from OASAS, right? Because it's often considered like a state level problem, and New York State tends to do relatively well in terms of funding this. And by the way, much of the funding from OASAS comes from taxes on gambling income at say casinos or slot machines, you know, some proportion of that money that, that disappears into those systems is actually given to OASAS to fund this treatment. Um, okay, Oop, what happened here? So, uh, right, so that's just a kind of like an overview of the kind of services that we provide, who we are, where we get our funding, our administrative structure. We're here, we're in, we're in the community, where we're willing to help members of the community with gambling disorder. Um, I think, you know, uh, if if we can have, a, you know, more people within our community know 
that were there. Um, that's great. Uh, you know, the other aspect of that though is that we're we're kind of full, right? We 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 have a limited amount of funding. Uh, Oasis gives us a certain amount of money, and again, because of that complicated administrative structure that I mentioned to you before, part of why that's re relevant is because because every other gambling disorder clinic in the state of New York can bill patients, can bill Medicaid, can bill Medicare for the services that they provide. We cannot. So we are entirely dependent on this grant from the state of New York through OASAS to provide this free treatment to patients. But because we're, again, in this weird administrative uh, kind of no man's land, we are not really allowed to sort of bill for our services. And so we're sort of stuck with whatever OASAS gives us. And, you know, they are limited in terms of how much they can provide. So, so we're always operating at a kind of a full capacity with a waiting list and so on. But that's also to say that we want people to come to us. We want to have patients engage and, you know, help them to, if they can't come to get services from us, to try to find other places where they can get services. Um, but I'm also telling you all that uh, in case any of you are interested in advocating uh, at the state level for, you know, increased funding for the type of services that we provide. Um, so anyway, uh, with that, I'll just let, you know, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them. Uh, but it's been a pleasure to talk to you all. All right. Well, th thank you, uh, Doctor. Um, uh, le let me uh, uh, um, uh, let me start off by, by asking, um, how long has the clinic uh, been open and operating? Well, um, you know, uh, let me think about that. It's been probably about 15 or so years. I, then don't quote me on that because I haven't been here the entire time. It was started initially. Yeah. So it's been maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, right. So I, well, I, I, yeah, I can give you a more exact okay. figure, but I'd have to look that up. So, uh, so the purpose of the presentation today is, is, is in conjunction with an application you're making for mm -hmm. certification, but um, uh, it confuses me because I would think you would already be certified. Yes, it's an I interesting mean, question. Right. So so OASAS, we are an OASAS approved program, right? And we've been around for a while in this approved category. And again, that the reason why we have not been certified is related to this complex administrative structure where we are we are within an OMH facility. And, and, and you know, OASAS, to their credit, has always been saying, well, you guys, you know, you need to be certified and you get grants from us and everything. And so, and then when we try to do that, then we have to go to OMH and say, well, you are actually the people who own this clinic and run this clinic, and you are the need, people who need to get certified. And then, you know, there's all this administrative rigmarole that begins, and then the certification gets sort of stuck. So finally, I think actually with my tenure, I, it's one thing that I'd like to take credit for, we sort of started to move through some of that logjam and address so some of those, those, those issues. And so now we're finally in the phase where we're getting that certification. Um, and, and the purpose of it is for you to be able to qualify for certain grants? Well, it's, you know, part of it is just that we're being, you know, we're, we're required to, you know, I mean, OASAS certifies us. It's a kind of a marker of quality, although I, I will say that we we have, relatively speaking, if I do say so myself, probably among the higher quality treatment that you can get for gambling disorder, because, you know, we are we are housed with an academic medical center department of psychiatry that is, you know, one of the, you know, uh, I would say, you know, best departments of psychiatry in the country. And there's a lot of high standards for clinical care and research and uh, administration that go on there. So, so we don't just have OASIS that we have to answer to. Um, and so, and, and we, we are also a place that trains people in the treatment of gambling disorder. We train physicians, we train psychologists, we train social workers. And so because of that, you know, we're going to train people in the highest quality evidence-based, scientifically-based treatment. So, you know, the OASIS certification is a nice thing to have. And you know, in theory, it would qualify us to, to bill for services to like Medicaid, you know, really what you need certification for is for billing Medicare and Medicaid. But because we can't do that, our certification is a little bit more like, oh, it's more pro forma. Just to answer your question, so, it's, it, it's so, a complicated issue. It gets into all. Of those so, so, so even after you obtain the certification, presuming that you do, you, you would not be able to bill for Medicare and Medicaid? Mm -hmm. No, we would not oh, because oh. because the because the Office of Mental Health. Okay. Um, first of all, because we're in a, we're in a research psychiatric institute right. that actually doesn't allow anybody to pay for treatment within oh, within oh. the building. 
Oh, it's free. It's free anyway. Yeah. It's a is grant. Free. It's a grant initiative, Steve. Oh, I feel yeah. Like yeah. And, and the grant is technically for deficit funding, right? So if you're mm -hmm. another program and you're billing for Medicaid and Medicare, you know, you might have a shortfall of a little bit and they, this is meant to make up for that. Our entire uh, budget is through this deficit funding. I should also add actually that we are one of the largest, if not the largest treatment program in the state in terms of the number of patients that we serve, right? So we're in this weird designation where we're, again, we're not really doing the standard thing where we're billing for services, but because we're located in New York City and we are this, you know, established program, we have we have a lot of patients who, who depend on our services. So I think that's a reason why OASAS okay. keeps funding us. All right, that was my next question. How many, how many people are you serving? Right. So currently we have, um, you know, we have about 50 patients in our census, right? And that's about how many new patients we get each year. And we provide about, you know, I would say anywhere from like 900 to 1,000 kind of like services, quote unquote, per year. That's usually meaning like individual psychotherapy sessions or group therapy sessions or craft sessions each year. And this is split among three or four you know, psychotherapists, some of whom are full-time, half-time, myself included as well, um, uh, you know, who are providing uh, treatments. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're a very busy yeah. clinic. And um, you know, so, we... so, so roughly 50 patients who, uh, when you total up all of the individual uh, and uh, sessions, uh, adds up to uh, between uh, 900 to 1,000 such uh, sessions over the course of a year. That's right. That's, that's, okay. the, that's the estimate. Yeah. And we would like to do more. Uh, and in fact, we're, we're currently in the process of requesting funding to, you know, right. hopefully maybe increase that by about 50%, meaning hiring new therapists, et cetera. Okay, well, uh, well, 50% well, is not quite double or nothing. Um, so, uh, uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, 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 OC, you have a question? Yes, I do have a question. Um, um, I would like to know um, if you have data as to where the patients are coming from by zip code. And yeah. I, I'm specifically looking for information about our four zip codes and for, uh, for our district. And yeah. what percentage of those are, you know, from the whole, you know, the total patients, what percentage right. of patients are coming from from our district. You meaning the district 12? Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually don't have that data in front of me and don't right. know it okay. off the top of my head, but I can I can get that. You know, we, we have patient zip codes and stuff like that. Um, what I can tell you is that our patients come from all over uh, New York City. And now in the COVID era where, you know, patients can get remote treatment, we've also started to treat patients in like Westchester County and even to some extent in upstate New York. Um, I wouldn't be able to say that like the majority of patients come from within this particular, you know, catchment area, because again, we are part of the reason we're the largest program is because we're, we, we serve, you know, beyond just this local area. So, so we have patients from all over the city. Right. But, but as a community board 12, uh, we are more concerned about our district. Sure. And I understand it's great that everyone else can, you know, they have a place to go if they need to, if they want to. But we are really concerned about our district. So it will be great to have the data, how, what, how many people are coming from our district and what, you know, the percentage of them, uh, you know, sure. the total um, number yeah. of patients you have. Sure. Well, we can, I can get that to you, you know, right. your contact information. I'll, we'll have to kind of, you know, go through a bunch of charts and kind of collate that, but, um, sure. you know, um, and, and what will you do with that data? Just so I know, like, uh, is it just, uh, yeah, just, yeah. I'll so, have to tell somebody I, I can, spend a day I, or so I, I, getting I, it. We, <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. I think I can chime in and yeah. find out. We need to know about that because, um, oh, yeah. we may be, we may, uh, need to, um, um, have some resolution about additional service that may need that may be needed. We, we, we don't know yet. So so okay. yeah. 
You know, you know, yeah, Dr. Nafi, one of the things, this is Sandra Harris, and I'm, yeah. I'm the VP for Government Community Affairs at the Medical Center. So mental health is, is one of those critical issues in, in our community. And as a community board and also as an institution, we're also looking at ways of how do we meet those needs in the local community. And, and we know that in terms of gambling, we have a serious issues here yeah. with, with the elderly, with the community. So I, I think it's, it's out of a great need to yeah. identify whether or not those needs are met in our neighbor community um, in particular. No, no, I, I think it's very important information um, for you guys to have. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to get it to you. It's just, you know, I, I just want to be mindful that, you know, we, we're, we're, we're operating in a kind of like a, you know, kind of a deficit funding where we're sort of packed full of patients and we're serving, you know, this whole, whole city. So I, I would like to problem solve with you all to figure out like what to do with that. Right. So let's say we find out that the local community is underrepresented among our, our patients. What does that mean, right? Does that mean that that we would need to then make make room somehow, or and that requires funding? And so again, like it's good information to have. That's why I was asking a slightly provocative question. Well, of like, what well, do we well, do well maybe maybe it also uh, um, uh, drives home a point that we need to uh, uh, make uh, make it known that you even exist, uh, yes. so that people can take advantage of the service. Because right. uh, I. I I mean, I, I was taken aback when you said you, you've been around for 10 or 15 years because I, I had uh, not that I should know every single service that's offered uh, at the medical center. But uh, uh, but I certainly know a lot of them. And right. uh, I, I, I had no idea that you were there. And I, and, and I had made the assumption right. uh, when you reached out and said you needed the certification. I, I thought that meant you were a new service. So yeah, uh, right. Yeah, uh, this is your, your these are all great points. This, this is all like a little bit non-standard right i mean even to yeah. the extent that even though we're part of the medical center there right. administratively we're sort of not like really kind of right. under it but yet yet we are and we have faculty appointments but you know so right. it's we're, we're sort of in this in between and yeah. and i think that it's it's actually this is part of the purpose of this meeting is to let you right. all know that we exist right because right. we've not been required to be oasis right. certified right. up until right. this point that's partly why you haven't right. heard of us. Right. And so that's why I right. felt it was important to come on and sort of, right. you know, meet you all. And, and right. so please do, please spread the word. Um, and, 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 fr and frankly, we, we haven't, uh, uh, we haven't done enough ourselves to uh, uh, reach out to the Psychiatric Institute and, uh, and learn about its services. Uh, I can say I've been chairing, I don't even want to, I've been chairing this committee for uh, uh, quite a number of years. And, uh, and, and frankly, I think uh, uh, maybe I've only had People from PI come before this committee maybe uh, two or three times. <laughs> You've had more, Steve. I think it goes back to our confusion over our affiliation with uh, New York State Psychiatric Institute and the research. And you've had uh, Dr. Lubatis on the, you've had oh, several yeah. presentation. I think it's understanding where these programs fit. Okay. This program in particular, because it's a research program and OASIS okay. is involved, has I more think. of a state. It, it's more um, like those programs that are run through a nonprofit organization that are strictly funded, free services and, and so on. But, okay. but you exactly. have it's understanding that duality in in oh, our God. affiliations. It's, right. it's and complicated. And that that question, is, Steve. <laughs> yeah, these okay. these are great questions. That's partly why I went through right. pains to sort of present that okay. confusing story before, because right. we we sit within this lacuna of of administrative designation, and right. and uh, you know, um, so so that idea that you know we're we're part of the medical center, but we're also most of the clinical services that are offered within the New York State Psychiatric Institute are actually research clinical yeah. trials. So, so most of the patients who are getting treatment through the New York State right. Psychiatric Institute per se are, are enrolled in some, some form of research project. And, and by dint of that, their treatment is free because it's actually they're being they're actually pay, you know often paid research subjects, uh, or they're just getting free treatment in exchange for you know, being uh, essentially research subjects. And that's different from clinical care provided, for example, Dr. Batista, he's he's the director of clinical services, which is a different administrative right. branch than the research side of the Psych Institute. And, and that's actually a relatively smaller kind of administrative body than the research side. We're, we're primarily as a, as a department are known for and are funded for research and in terms of the right. footprint we occupy right. it's, it's a right. primarily right. research institute right in case you're wondering. Uh, uh, let, let, let me move on to uh, sure. tanya you have a question uh yeah um 
first of all, I'm glad to hear about this uh, program. Um, <laughs> it's 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 great. Uh, it's definitely needed. Um, just wanted to know about uh, the lottery, <laughs> right? Because yeah. uh, a lot of people in this community, I've seen them. They hardworking people. You see yeah. them in the bodegas spending a hundred dollars. Right. They're, you know, of the income they don't, they, most of the people that I mean, don't have disposable income, right? Mm-hmm. So they're hoping upon hope to achieve the American uh, dream uh, by winning the lottery. And it's, it's, it's really something. It's sad. And I think that, I and mean, I see that. And have you, like, what is, I think that's an area that needs sure. to be addressed. I know it's kind of political because the, the lottery is touted yeah. as, you know, this whole thing that's supposed to be helping this or, you know, uh, helping people, you know, achieve the dream and then funding certain things. But it, it really is destructive when people, you see people continuously playing it, playing it, playing it, giving their last dollars to the lottery. Right. You know, uh, where the odds are just worse than if you're gambling in the casino. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, definitely, so. definitely. Yeah, it's uh, it's I, I completely agree. You know, and we, we have relatively few patients coming to us for treatment of, you know, lottery related problems compared to online gambling, sports gambling, uh, casino gambling, these kinds of things. Um, but and, and why that is, is an interesting question. It may be related to some extent to this outreach question, because, you know, and that's part of the, what's terrible about this whole kind of lottery situation is it's sort of, for lack of a better term, you know, preys upon low income people. Right. It's it's it's. And so, you know, the the people who might come to us may have sort of more wherewithal or sort of more resources or things like that, where they're saying, okay, we're going to get treatment for this particular, there is even treatment for gambling disorder, right? Knowing that, that that even exists is a marker of maybe some, some, excuse me, functioning or socioeconomic status or what have you. And so there, there's a bias there that potentially needs to be addressed. And so hopefully through outreach, and you guys can hopefully play a role in that, you know, we can have more people coming in who have lottery related problems. Now, you know, so, you know, somebody going and getting, you know, $10 worth of lottery tickets a week, I'm going to say, okay, that's probably, you know, hey, why, you know, if it gives you a little bit of a brief hope of your hope, your future being better, and it gives you a little lift in your spirits and you never win. Okay, great. But, you know, yeah, to the extent that you have limited income and you're spending even that $10 a week that, you know, you could be feeding your kids with, uh, it's problematic. It's it's also problematic that the state is engaging in in that right and you know uh, I, yeah. I hear you I hear you it's like well oh well, we're funding education and okay right. Right. whose education are you funding right. is that going back into the same community that is sort of you know suffering from no. this right exactly so you know there's there there's many uh, kind of justice related kind of questions that come out of that and so so we are but we we will treat lottery related problems too that falls within our wheelhouse and um yeah so hopefully more patients who have those problems can come to us well, let me how can we create more that. awareness about the lottery how can we create more awareness that the lottery is playing the lottery is gambling and, and, it, yeah. and for some it is a, it's a gamble that people shouldn't be making you know um good good how, question yeah, I, I, Sorry, I guess, Steve, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't have an answer to it. I, we could speculate on it, but then that, that might be a, a whole other conversation. Yeah, that's, uh, another, okay. that's another meeting. Uh, I, I, okay. Uh, well, thank uh, you for this uh, important conversation. Um, I think making sure that the mental health needs of our community are met has been a topic that this board is focused on for some time now. And this certainly is a part of that. Um, I was just curious, I know you touched on it briefly a moment ago, talking with Tanya about sports betting. Um, New York legalized sports betting, of course, mm-hmm. and then the city was inundated with advertising for sports betting services. Yeah. I was curious if that correlated with an increase in the demand oh, of your services at all. Definitely, definitely, yeah. No, the 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 sports betting. I mean, again, you know, we've all, we've always been kind of full, right? So, but but the proportion of patients who have sports betting problems has increased uh, as a as a as a function of of this, um, and you know, which is also related, by the way, to this this phenomenon where I've I've gotten a lot of like, you know, media and journalists and stuff, you know, like. With because it's an obvious question of like, are you seeing an uptick in this? And it's a little early, I think, to because there's not like epidemiological data yet 
on this. You know, as a, as a physician and a scientist, of course, I want to look at that and see it in a more systematic, rigorous way is like to what extent, but but just on an anecdotal clinical level and what we're seeing in our relatively small slice, it's it's a it's a pretty marked uptick uh, in our in our population. Um, and uh, so yeah, it's it's very problematic. You know, uh, I, I was very kind of disheartened when I when I saw that because I, I think that I mean, unlike the the lottery, which you know ostensibly benefits the state of New York and education and so on, of course that's that has its own problems. Well, who is sports betting benefiting, right? It's essentially successful lobbying by these powerful corporations, and you know, and then they're preying on on people who are vulnerable, right? And, and a lot of these people are are have gambling disorder, and they're and and it's also particularly problematic, I think, for young people too. You know, they're they're interested in sports. They they admire athletes. They they want to be you know they watch sports. They play sports in school, and so it's it's already this kind of like you know, sort of easy entry into the system where it's like, we're all watching games and getting into it and rooting for our team and all, oh, you know, and then now the betting part kind of kind of gets sidled in there and the advertising is over the top. So uh, it's a real problem. It's terrible. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Julio, uh, uh, you have a comment or a question? No, th thank you, Steve. I, I have a question. Um, since um, the office is- uh, Julio, you want to identify who you are? Uh, yeah, I'm Julio. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he, he is the uh, government. I'm, 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 I'm with I'm with New York Presbyterian Hospital. Yeah, I think I think Julio, we we may have met once before yeah. in another context. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Right. So, so, so I just want to ask, since, since you know, as part of the state, uh, you know, your office, does the state by any chance, sort of like the legislature, their staff, ever contact your office in terms of some of these proposals, especially now that they have voted on creating these additional casinos, licenses in, in New York City. And also as part of that, would there be an increased funding for your services as a result of these casinos coming online? Right, uh, so so um, so no, we have not been contacted uh, because you know, we're, we're, you know we're, 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 cl we're a clinical entity. I think the state sees us that way as like, you're gonna treat the problem. We don't necessarily want your opinion on like wh whether this legislation is right or, or wrong. Um, I'm just speculating there, but we we've not been you know consulted on whether this is a, a good idea or not. Um, there there may have been some involvement in the, in the New York Council on Problem Problem Gambling, right, which is a kind of a, a, a nonprofit entity that that is you know focused on gambling disorder, and we 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 have some you know collaborations with them. In fact, I'm going to set up a meeting with them next week to just talk about how how we can work together in sort of prevention and treatment services. In terms of how it impacts funding, I think that's a that's a critical question. You know, I'm I'm in the process of, as I think I mentioned, applying for an increase in our OASAS grant. One of the things that I I have written in that grant, because I, I write a lot of grants, is like, you know, listen, you know, we we have an uptick in our our needs because of this increase in in sports betting and, and now 